Welcome to the Tabletop Gaming Guild show. Tabletop Gaming Guild is all about the experiences and memories playing board games with friends and families can create. Tonight, we have a special episode where we are going to be interviewing Johnny Pack, a game designer for a bunch of different games. And we'll be taking a look at some of the stuff that he's in development with, has developed, and talk about you know what goes into that side of the board game uh, hobby, as we always talk about you know playing the games, but there's a whole different side to that. So... Uh, let's turn it over here to Johnny. If you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, yeah, I'm a freelance game designer and developer. So I toggle between both those things. Sometimes I pitch games to publishers and work on those until completion. And other times uh, a service I provide is to take an existing game and kind of bring it to the finish line. So the publisher can then put it out. I'll work on that kind of in-between period where um between it being pitched, signed, and then released into the game, as you know. it, So um, some of those lines get blurred, um, as a lot of times I'll also develop the games that I author, um, which is kind of part of the package deal I've been leaning towards these days. So I want to talk a little bit about Endless Winter, because uh, that one you're doing with, uh, is it Fantasa Games? I can, am uh, I yeah, saying Fantasia. that one right? And that's, yeah, it's Fantasia. Fantasia. And I th- think that's like the third or fourth game they've published this is their flagship it's their flagship. first one uh the people behind it have been uh, involved in different parts of the industry so uh, like okay. yoma the uh the art director and owner of co-owner of the company has done the artwork um and graphic design for like planet unknown which just uh yeah. came out recently it's been made a big splash so uh so yeah everybody on the team is is kind of done stuff before and then they came together and kind of formed a super group to launch uh, Fantasia with Endless Winter and then their sophomore uh, effort is going to be Unconscious Mind coming to Kickstarter uh, this fall winter. That's really cool. Um, <clears throat> for Endless Winter, do you want to say a little bit about that process that you went through for that? Uh, yeah, so I was brought on as a developer uh, of the core game and then I designed the expansions that were kind of included it's one of those big kickstarters where yeah you get the base game it's brand new and then there's also a whole bunch of expansions all at once it was like a big kitchen sink kind of thing uh so first off was working on the core with the knowledge that i also had to um make it uh, expandable that there's gonna be some stuff that's gonna be fitted into that and um it's kind of nice is is working on a project like that is uh you get a little less of that bolted on expansion thing where uh, maybe a game is a success. They didn't really realize it would yeah. be a couple of years later. They go, Hey, let's try to, you know, double dip this thing and come up with an expansion. And then they always go like, Hmm, why don't we add like a, a God track and a sideboard or a unique player powers or something. And sometimes it doesn't integrate very well. Um, and in this case, it's kind of cool to get the opportunity to look at, all right, this will be good for the core. And then we can fit this in perfectly and anticipate, um, expansion content so even like the play mat and stuff like that has spots where we knew the expansion content would fit into it and kind of looking at the whole table presence um the play length and all that being able to play test uh, literally like everything all at once um, make sure it was compatible it was pretty cool yeah that's nice to have all the play testers and everything all in line to do the base game and then work in the expansions and make sure everything is balanced and that's one thing i'm always interested about is like how is the balancing part like the most nerve-wracking part of designing especially when it comes to expansions uh balancing is it it can be kind of um it's we could say it's like a chore or something like that but it's actually something that's uh there's there's the spreadsheet way of doing it which is part of it is making sure everything kind of works out on paper and then there's the carrots and sticks part which is Uh, trying to get players to actually do what you want them to do and sometimes tweaking the balance uh skewing it so something is slightly better than something else so that players will do that slightly better thing um more often and then trying to make sure that there's no like red herring things where there's oh this looks really fun players go do that thing because it looks fun but they always lose Mm -hmm. uh you really don't want that in your games and so it's it's trying to make sure that if you have multiple paths to victory or um you know competing demands that sort of thing that they actually have a, a chance to win um, by following each of those those things. So I have some little you know tricks up my uh, sleeves for balancing, um, say like the numbers part of it. I kind of look at like the the fundamental action that somebody's going to do in a in a game, whether that's like placing a worker 
and kind of assigning uh, a value to what your turn entails and what a basic turn would get you if you're kind of not paying attention and then a, what a uh, with some foresight planning and a very good move what that could get you kind of look at that window and look at um, that as basically your, your unit of effort and then dividing that amongst all the different things and then you subdivide all those things amongst all the different tendrils that the game can work into and you reward people for um, more like future planning so for instance uh a lot of like point salad games get criticism where like uh, anything you do gives you a victory point and you could like throw a meeple at a game board and hit it, hit, hit a victory point And it's all nonsense. Cause it just comes out in the wash. Um, I think, you know, that's funny, but in truth, it's like, if you can reward players for comboing a whole bunch of stuff together and it'll actually uh, net more points than the sum of all those little incidental things, then you've actually got something there. That's, that's pretty cool. And uh, that, rewards the players for planning and feeling clever and seeing multiple systems at once and juggling spinning plates, all the, all the good stuff we like in those zero games. Yeah. And the games I appreciate most are the ones that have like viable, multiple viable strategies. So I really appreciate someone taking the time to make sure that those work. And it's really fun exploring those, especially when they're not like they jump, they don't jump out at you, but they're things that you can find as you go through plays. So I really do like that a lot. Yeah, I do too. Um, one of the kind of two schools of thought is it's a very subtle distinction is, is uh, if you have multiple paths to victory, say in a game and they are discoverable, like the designer actually made it. And it's like, you know, here's a ladder, you do this thing and then you go here and step two, and then you do this and you do this and this, this will should compete with this other, you know, shipping strategy versus this building strategy. Um, they kind of, if they're kind of scripted in a way and you're trying to reverse figure out that the designer put those in there and how do you follow this path and they might have put particular buildings and they might have really like long-winded smart version of like oh in the third round you totally have to get the building discounts on the fourth round you do this not and then it'll you'll hit 75 points and i'll be competitive and the other school is kind of like looking at a more like an emergent process of you build like a, a rich sandbox where a lot of things can happen and you actually can let somebody create their path to victory in that spot. And so it wasn't something that it, it may be something I've never done before, but I know it's a possible, it's, it's part of the possibility space. And uh, I really like that because I think, you know, no matter how much we play test games, you know, the day it comes out in the market, it's going to be hundreds and thousands more times being played than we possibly can during play testing. So it has to be robust enough to know that all these different things can happen and not be so crystalline that if uh, this one little strategy, which, which I think works suddenly breaks or something like that, you know, fault really comes back on the uh, publisher and designers and developers. Leave it to the horde of players to find the one way to break the game. <laughs> yeah. Or, or just have a rich enough environment that, you know, people argue for eons, uh, whether or not it is breakable or not. I think if people kind of what you want. have to have a forum where there's a constant argument of whether something's overpowered or not then it probably isn't and it's probably just mm-hmm. that guy was good playing that yeah and these other strategies are viable it's just they're not they're playing people they're playing against aren't doing them it's basically what i find and i think emergent gameplay is the way that makes games more replayability or have higher replayability for me and the ones that stay on my shelf the longest mm-hmm. you have static games which i have tons of them that are okay they don't survive very long because once you get going you're like oh i already know what the optimal moves are yeah why am i playing this anymore yeah exactly you kind of call out all the things not to do and then it's not really fun to play with a new player because they won't know those things and they'll just stumble into that and you'll just you know you'll you'll trounce them every time yeah so it's it's a little a little less fun for everybody. It's not fun to be trounced. It's not fun to trounce somebody if, if you know that they're just making novice mistakes, right? So it definitely makes sense. And I do appreciate on the flip side, some of the games are very complicated, so it takes a couple plays to get people into. Mm-hmm. And you ease them into that so they can get those deep, rich strategies. That's fine, too. Um, but yeah, um, what the one game that I did play that you designed that I really, really liked, and I played it over at Evan's house, was Merchant Cove. Oh, yeah, I loved how like I was really like first off like really interested in 
like the amount of work that had to get to get those super asymmetric merchants to work properly against each other and balance had to be crazy because they're really different. They're all very, very different. And then with the new expansions coming out that do change like the environment of the, um, what is it called? The cove itself. Mm -hmm. And then balancing that with the different merchants, like what, what is that process like? Yeah, it's kind of, of interesting one. Well, yes. <laughs> um, so I, there's a couple of tricks um, when I came onto the project and was really trying to figure out how to, how to solve that exact problem. And uh, it's, it's a very asymmetrical game that every game is very much, you know, a, a mini game. It's kind of a homage to some games that we really love that are in that. So you can kind of see like some of the new stuff is sulk in with the gears turning and you might see a little potion explosion with the alchemist with the marbles and things like that. Um, what I needed was some sort of like a fundamental something that would unify that thing. And that, uh, was kind of the, the time track and that was able to really go like, okay, if you spend hours on this little time track to do certain things, regardless how crazy different those things are cosmetically, whether you're rolling some dice with this one or pulling marbles with that one or spinning a spinner or going around the rondelle or doing all kinds of nonsense, uh, if I know that you have to spend a certain amount of hours to do it, then the output is going to be that you're generating goods, which will be sold in a similar way at a basically a fluctuating stock market, which is kind of in disguise, but it kind of looks like Imhotep with boats and all that. But ultimately, you're, you're playing with the, the stocks of uh, what's going to happen in a given round. And um, so part of that was assigning those, those values to the time timing and those are also have some interesting dynamics and the subtlety is going to come in where if it's like okay well if we looked at it on a per hour basis uh, say it takes the alchemist you know three hours to make this good and does it take three hours for the blacksmith to make that good not necessarily so because some of them are going to work on a um a quicker flip sort of thing so a, the blacksmith for instance will use uh small amounts of time to turn uh, and quickly make a bunch of goods but they have to just keep making them and they don't get as much foresight where the alchemist uh, will kind of get to that equilibrium point where the right amount of hours is gone per unit, but they have to wait and make a really big batch of everything, gather, 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 gather. And they get the opportunity kind of like in a bidding game to make your stuff last. So you get to watch, 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 and then you finally brew all your potions and bring them to market right when you think the round's going to end and try to match those to the ships that are already docked where the blacksmith is going to be a faster, uh, turnover and they might be the one docking the ships trying to create the value uh on a goods per goods basis so those asymmetries are kind of accounted for in a way but you also just have to play to that stuff and that's where i think um kind of like next level oh the blacksmith's easy because it's just matching numbers and colors you go yeah but the arc of which it plays at is different than the arc of some of these other ones and the real extremes would be like the um innkeeper which actually plays to like this little extra phase that gets tacked on after all the markets and stuff there's some meeples that are going to come back to the inn and they're going to sleep in all these little different beds and have drinks and get into bar brawls and stuff um so you really have to kind of play a, a meta game on the next level for that one um yeah so that's kind of the the fundamental was really just getting the the time track cost and then knowing that ultimately everybody's gonna be making goods that are roughly the same value like the dragon rancher makes these big overvalued goods um but we kind of accounted for that too. It's kind of like a super good and it's like, okay, well that, that's kind of like a good and a half worth of this. And we're, you have to sell these at say the black market or whatever. And that's going to discount um, some of that value from the assumed corruption costs. And we try to balance it out like that. Um, so it's, I, I don't know if it's perfectly balanced, honestly. And part of that the way to kind of obfuscate some of that is, through a multiplicative scoring system. So instead of just being like, this good is worth seven victory points and this, that, and having itty bitty small metrics, we kind of have these big things where it's like, if you sell a big yellow good at the right market at the right moment, it might be worth like 48 points. And that could be the difference of the game right there. And that could all be down to like, did you park that ship or did somebody else park it at the last moment? And so it becomes very tactical. Um, and so when I see people say, oh, I lost by 50 points. And that's like, that might've been like one good, didn't make it onto the docks at the right moment. Um, and it could have totally tipped you from being last to first or something like that. It can be very drastic. So, um, so I think that that kind of softens the blows of uh, not having like such a crunchy small numbers kind of game to have these big kind of explosive swingy numbers to 
to really help you come back by playing the market instead of just playing your player board um, overly focused on its own puzzle. Yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> a funny story about that. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say about the blacksmith itself, every single board has like interesting decisions you have to make, even that board there. You have to decide whether you want to advance your dice pool more with that one, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> Ate them. Anyway, no, I don't. Cats. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I played the uh, Chronomancer, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. And I, everyone thought that I, I, the Chronomancer was completely broken for the first half of the game. Oh, really? I created this engine in there, and I was getting all the gold stuff. And we, I was making sure the meeples would come down so I could trade them really good. And then I realized, wait a minute. I just broke my own engine because my engine was only doing these things, and it took forever for me to switch goods. Yeah. So I'm like, I should have thought about this a little better because in the second half of the game, I had stuff I couldn't sell. Right. And I was like, Yeah, we, we pushed we pushed uh, all the yellow meeples that came in. Yeah, they were they like, went into the town. They it. were I'm not like, coming to the docks anymore. And I like that that's almost like a, a hidden resource depletion into the game. Like, you can buy all this you want in the beginning, but if you're so heavily into this one color, you're going to run out. Yeah, and, and nobody's going to want to buy. As soon as that game ended, I was like, I need to play again because I know how to make this work properly. <laughs> yeah, James <laughs> almost lapped us in the first in the first yeah. round, and then after that, like we just steady caught up. And I think Peter won by one, right? No, he, yeah, nice. he won. I didn't. I was back behind. I think he might have beat you by one, maybe. Okay. Yeah, it was. But yeah, I, I I do love the fact that like every, it's you're playing your own game within the game that everyone is playing and the the time resource is phenomenal with that to how it ties everyone together it was really well designed i like that yeah. i love that with it being on kickstarter now we have seven merchants we're adding four more plus the mm -hmm. kickstarter exclusive which is from what i understand designed upon you <laughs> yeah that's kind of funny I, I we were making like the game maker one um you know i knew it was going to be uh I pitched that, you know, and they got approved and I didn't realize that they're going to do like, you know, the little Micho avatar that I've been using from, uh, I was featuring one of the cards. They basically turned that into uh, the character, which is fun. And then um, through a bunch of idiosyncratic goofiness, at some point I was at, uh, I was at Gen Con 2019. I ended up having my shoes get wet. I ended up having to go and demo a Sierra West a Western game uh in these big orange crocs and i had this entire like getup of western wear but big orange crocs so i kind of be known as the cowboy and crocs and it became this little like meme thing and just rolled and rolled and rolled and of course people in the next image are like you're gonna wear the crocs right and of course they show up in the crocs and uh so that made it into the, the little miniatures i've got this little crazy avatar of me with uh wearing crocs right there <laughs> that's in, awesome in Cove. so <laughs> yeah probably the first uh, miniature with crocs in the entire universe so yeah. I remember where you have to paint them orange, Evan. Yeah, right. If you're going to do it right, they got to yeah, be orange. Do it right, you got to do it. <laughs> Tell that to everybody. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's pretty a uh, yeah rich environment, and uh, yeah, the guys kind of added some new stuff that I kind of took a backseat on. Is like a lot of the um, the new boards and some of the new characters. That was, I believe, um, I think it was Carl, the kind of the originator of the project. Uh, really focused heavily on the Sulkin style, the baker baked goods ones. And that's kind of been his like real passion project for that one. And I think Drake fronted um, most of the development on the other three. Did you do the dragon one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, dragon one. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, that was kind of a, it was a fun one. We sat around, um, the three of us got on this phone call one night. And we're just like, all right, people keep asking for dragon rancher on the Kickstarter. And it was like halfway through the campaign. And uh, so, so what should we do with dragons? We just started spitballing ideas. We're like, well, there's some Moncala and old dragons go around eating stuff and just, you know, growing and laying eggs and all this other nonsense. And we just uh, kind of rolled with it and got a testable prototype and saw that it was promising enough. And we're like, you know what? We're going to create this, this other character and it'll be available in the pledge manager of the original campaign. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so it, it worked out like right there almost in real time. Yeah, so... Um... Just to go back a little bit, what really got you into designing games? What was your driving factor into designing games? Um, I was, I've always been kind of a creative person. So I've done like art and music and, and 
bunch of other odds and ends over the years. And I was uh, running an art gallery, doing music, and uh, I was also a hobbyist with the game. So I had a pretty big collection. I was using the art gallery as kind of our game night meetup spot. And people kept saying, oh, you should, you should design a game. And I was really pretty intimidated by the I guess like the math and stuff like that. I knew that, you know, mm-hmm. Reiner Knizia is like this, you know, mathematician. You hear about these like statistician dudes like making these, these you know, crazy German board games. And I was, I was pretty intimidated by it. Even though I had like a good grasp on say like music theory and stuff, I still think it's is technical. It is, um, it's still kind of a soft science compared to like crunching hard numbers. Um, so I appreciated the board games, but I was actually a little too afraid to make say an economic game. And then as far as like, making abstracts or something the idea that there's these chess masters and people play go and pente and they write books and i'll get all queen's gamut on the thing um <laughs> it's that's intimidating to think that there's basically just gonna be people way smarter than you that are gonna break your game if you if it's a game of perfect information like that and so i, I needed something um to kind of ease into that was somewhere in between and what i didn't realize was that almost all board games start just as broken messes and they don't work. <laughs> and um, unlike, you know, a good jam session or something like that, a lot of times you can make up a good song, like right on the spot or you can go and draw something really cool right there, at, you know, uh, portrait Disneyland, whatever, um, that all games just basically just don't work and they're a neat idea. And as soon as they hit the table, they fall apart. And if anything, there's some promise um, left there and it's just this iterative process and it's a process that uh it's really best if you invite other people's opinions in and you watch people and you listen and you ask questions and take feedback very openly and you iterate you just keep keep turning it and uh that was that was kind of a new um method for me since my background is more just like the arts and stuff where you just you do it and it's you kind of hope that it's i don't know comes out the gates like in a more solid form than than what games do and so once i saw that board games are kind of you know started broken got worked on um they were less intimidating for me because it's like if you just sit here and tell yourself uh i can make a broken game right um cool so so does so everybody um and you know eventually even meeting some of my heroes of game design like and seeing their games in early states where they're also kind of timid and it's still got their handwriting on it and seeing that even the greatest game designers i can think of um start off with sketches and they they work on this stuff and uh and that's i don't know that really takes the edge off and makes it makes it like okay just keep working at this it'll it'll get where it needs to go and uh, that kind of fueled me to continue um, making games so it's been 10 years now that i uh first kind of started with that so what was that what was the first game you designed it was a game called kings of artifice it has like a really tragic um development story that uh, uh some people know about some people don't um it's it's just one of those things like everything that can go wrong with the game uh for a new designer or any designer went wrong with that game and it's just like um it's like a great case study and what not to do as a as a new designer so that that was a pretty rude awakening for me and at that point it was either just you know, leave the industry never try again or try something completely different and so my my second game was something i just kickstarted myself back when kickstarter was hardly a thing we're pre-exploding kittens kind of kickstarter i i had to say hey you want to kickstart my game and they go what's kickstarter it's crowdfunding what's crowdfunding like it was it was that early so it was a very modest sort of thing so i made basically a very small like vanity run of this other game and kind of cut my teeth on that and saw the back end learned about manufacturing and basics of fulfillment and all that stuff and uh, saw how much work it was. And I was like, I don't wanna do all this work. And so I wanna switch and try to pitch again, but I wanna be smart about it this time and try to find publishers that are gonna treat me a little better than those first guys did. That leads into, so that leads into my questions because I'm looking at your uh, accreditations and I'm saying, okay, you know, you start off you, every few years, you're publishing a game, then something happened. And then in 2019, suddenly you're publishing all these games or designing all these games. So what kind of triggered that? big increase and made you more prolific all of a sudden um it was just well it was bad luck that i didn't get anything before then but um after fulfilling the the game in 2015 i switched and was like all right i'm gonna pitch games and i was listening to podcasts and getting advice about going to speed dating events pitching contests all the the racket 
And I started to hedge my bets. It's like, what if I make, you know, some lighter games, some medium games, games of different um, scope. And so if I do get the opportunity to talk to a publisher someday, uh, I can at least ask them like, what weight of game are you looking for? And if they're looking for something smaller and simpler, it might be something like what turned into a fistful of meeples. And if they wanted something bigger, I could say, oh, I've got this Coloma thing over here. And so I, I actually kind of filled out like a, like a portfolio of different games and uh, a bunch of diff different boxes in there. And then I built a really simple drag and drop web website um, where I kind of had a digital sell sheet for each of these things and a little business card with the link to that. And um, I just kind of went for broke and set myself to any uh, events I could where there was um, you know, game design challenge or speed dating, or I knew there was just gonna be publishers hanging out doing their thing whether that was bgg con or gamma or whatever else and just try to get it in front of people and hopefully uh, get a call back or something and um, honestly like all those games were rejected many 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 times before somebody took a risk on me which was <laughs> kind of funny it's like um, like fistful of meeples lost several competitions i think uh it also was rejected i want to say I've probably got in front of 25 to 30 different publishers that passed on it before somebody finally took it on a whim that they need a small box game in a bind and they're like hey if this fits our production timeline you got a small game i'm like yeah this thing they're like all right uh let's cost it out yeah it fits the cost okay screw it let's make it and there the rest is history it's on it's like fourth print run right now i think so um so some of those games that maybe i don't know maybe i would have walked away from at some point I was pretty perseverant about and eventually they found um, an audience which is which is hopeful <laughs> so um, but yeah it, it all kind of came together in 2019 where I had basically like three games that got signed and they all kind of converged and then I also um, started working on Merchant's Cove and that kind of blew up on Kickstarter and kind of put a feather in my cap and then I started getting the phone started ringing for more development work at that point. That, I like that. That's really smart. Uh, it seems like a lot of work, but yeah, it's really smart. I mean, a lot of publishers definitely seem to focus on specific types of games, and they're at, a, at any particular time might only be looking for something specific. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you think, oh, if I make a great game and then I publish, you know, send it to a publisher that wants a great game, um, they might say, oh, it doesn't fit. We have a standardized box size. It doesn't fit our box. Sorry. It looks like a great game. Or it might be something like, this is awesome. This has simultaneous action selection in it. And our next game in the pipeline is unannounced yet also has simultaneous action selection. We don't want to be typecast as the publisher that does this. So, sorry. Um, so there's just weird stuff like that happens. And sometimes it's good luck too, where um, Final Frontier at the time had kind of a wish list of they wanted to have a, um, a Western Euro. They just really wanted one. And I happened to have what was Coloma just sitting around and that was great because it was a perfect matchup and i think since then they've also had a few other things on that wish list like ultimately they would want like an indiana jones sort of something rather so anybody that's got that kind of like you know archaeological exploration style thing would have probably a better chance pitching that to them than if they just came out with like shipping in the mediterranean um or something like this that they're not interested in so looking across um the different games that you've designed. I, I can definitely see there's a, a theme or a favorite theme in there with um, the Western theme. Uh, you have Coloma, Sierra West, uh, Fistful of Meeples, Hangtown, definitely all have that the Western theme in there. So i um, going to naturally assume that is a favorite theme to apply to your games. But the question I, I'm going to have is, so when you design your games, do you go theme first or do you actually design the components and whatnot and then try to incorporate the theme after the fact? I try not to do it after the fact at this point. Um... I find that it's, there's a lot of people that come up with clever puzzles out there in games, and then they struggle and struggle and struggle and try to find a theme. And they end up usually slapping something on there and you can just kind of see straight through it and it feels pasted on. And um, I think if you can get a theme earlier in the design, it'll inform the, the design process and you'll end up with things that in the abstract would, would be kind of like nonsense. So. Like Mancala is a typically very abstract game, right? So it's just moving, moving pieces around in pits and you don't really know why you're doing it and what's going on. And um, with something like, say, Fistful of Meeples is very derivative of Mancala, that there's actually the same amount of pits around this circular board and there's a whole bunch of little things that you drop off, which is now Cowboy Meeples. Um, the idea with that was I wanted 
take Moncala and say Western theme and worker placement and mash these together. And so I'd start off and just go, okay, well, if I just moving these pieces around, you have an objective to make them land different spots, fine. But what do, what do cowboys want to do, right? And it's like saying, well, they want to mine for gold. They want to hold up banks. They want to do cowboy things. And so as you're kind of exploring that space, uh, you start to come up with something like, all right, this one's at the end of the street and this one's at the end of the street because, you know, shootouts always happen on in the street and movies and stuff like that. And there's a duel and one of them usually walks away and sometimes both don't. Um, so I was like, all right, well, if a piece lands on this end and a piece lands on that end and uh, then they got to pair it off and you go like, all right, well, how does that usually work? And it's like, it could be deterministic, like, oh, the better shot always wins, but not always true, um, as Man of Liberty Balance would tell you. So uh, it's like, all right, we'll use a simple mechanism, like, you know, dice. And so it's like, all right, you know, the higher roll wins. So it's something simple like that. And you go like, if you just pitched Moncala with dice that you just have to roll off periodically on either side of the table, that sounds kind of like it doesn't make any sense. And in this, in the Western sandbox, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. Um, and then just the characterization of like, okay, there's robbers and there's guys with gold. So it's like, if you put the robbers with the guys with gold, it goes to the robbers, right? And then if the deputy pops in where the robbers are, what happens to the robbers go to jail. Okay, well, what happens when they're in jail? Uh, well, dynamite blows them out of jail and then they go back to robbing again. So kind of working with little narrative arcs like that, uh, you just find mechanisms that will uh, basically do that thing and um, embody that. And I think, had it just been a clever derivative of Mancala, I work on it for a year or something, and then just decided to put cowboy hits on the on the beans, it, it wouldn't really make any sense. It's like looking up the games design. You, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I actually brought it up, and it is uh, super interesting, and that's an unconscious mind game that you were working on. Uh, where you have to uh, play through dreams and has multi-purpose cards, which I'm a sucker for multi-purpose cards and worker placement. It just sounds amazing. <laughs> and that's the game that's uh, that's coming out on Kickstarter soon. Yeah, we're demoing it at Essen uh, in about three weeks. It'll be there. We have a bunch of um, prototype copies being shipped to us from Manufacture right now, which will be there. And then uh, shortly after Essen, we'll be kind of regrouping a little bit from jet lag and whatever else, and then we'll get the Kickstarter um, ready to launch shortly thereafter. So hopefully November. I really like the art on it too. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, the art director, Yoma has had this ambitious idea to try to take two famous artists, one Bosley, it works mostly in digital and Vincent Dutre, who still works with traditional, um, you know, pencils and things and see if they would mash up. And I remember being on kind of the first call where, uh, the artists were meeting and we we're discussing this and we we're kind of like, well, how are we going to blend this cover? Cause you really want the cover to bleed over. And we're sitting there going like, all right, well, Vincent does the bottom part here where there's, you know, the client in the real world and Bosley does this dreamy world back here. And if there's some color palette that ties it together and how do we blend these things, um, especially on this kind of ambitious cover and uh, kind of mapping out like, all right, I'll start and then where the red line is, you'll begin and I'll pass this off to you. And then we'll come back and we'll like touch all this up. And uh, for some reason, it reminded me of uh, the MC Escher metamorphosis with the birds and all that sort of thing. And I was like, hey, what if we took like the wallpaper of the birds and had it do the Escher thing where it turns into real birds and flying off into the distance? And we could actually um, use that as a transition to get that to work and it felt kind of cool to like have that suggestion and then see these great artists implement it in a really cool way yeah the box art is um, amazing yeah amazing. yeah they did a fantastic job on it and the the interior of the game has both artists and one is really in the domain of like the real world stuff so that's that's where vincent is doing most of this thing where you see kind of historical figures from vienna and stuff like that um cool portraits of people like you know Gustav Klimt or Egon Schilly or um, I think Mahler's and there's you know some really cool um, people from that time period and you know they're really beautiful just portraits of these folks and then of course we've got Bosley kind of going into this really like you know butterflies on a sailboat and stuff whales in the sky just all sorts of dream symbology um, that was taken from uh, 
mostly Facebook, just asking people, tell us about your crazy dreams. And oh, really? That's cool. Their weird dreams. And then Bosley would just kind of pick through and embody that stuff. And so a lot of people's dreams were the inspiration for uh, what ended up into in the uh, artwork. And so those kind of overlay, um, you know, blending those two worlds. And then there's, there's some sp other spots where literally the art kind of overlays where uh, there's Vincent's characters and they look happy or normal. And then we have transparent cards that are, we call the grief layers, which go over the, the cards and that will kind of create distress and weird, you know, nightmarish sort of afflictions on this person. So what you're trying to do as a therapist in this game is to bring them into your clientele and then give them different treatments. And when they reach kind of a catharsis point, the transparent card gets revealed and it shows them in their natural self. And then when they're fully healed, they go to your kind of a tableau and they're going to unlock special abilities and game scoring, um, set collection, other little things as you build up this clientele of people that you've treated over the course of the game, kind of engine build as well. I love yeah, that. I'm super excited that. to give that a give that a try. It sounds so good. That's like yeah, my that's perfect game there. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, there's there's personal rondelles and a giant rondelle in the middle of the game too. So if you're into like rondelles and action programming and worker placement, I mean, all that stuff is just like it's energizing in a really cool way. So it's it's definitely uh, got some fun crunch to it. I mean, if if you happen to have an extra copy after Essen, you know. <laughs> We will gladly review that one. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, I think um, I think they're sending me one either you know at S and after S and that, and I think there's a few prototype copies circulating around. So, but if you want to get in on the circuit, let me know. Oh, if that's actually a thing, then yes, definitely. I want to check that game out. <laughs> that game looks um, the art's amazing. The description of the game's amazing. I think that one's going to be a hit. Hope so. Yeah, we're we're really kind of banking on it. Uh, doing doing well so and it plays in and, 45 uh, to 90 minutes that is awesome i'd say it's it's more it's more like a 90 minute 45 would be like if it's two players and you really okay. know the rules up front um but more more likely it's gonna be a 60 to 90 like an hour and a half so good yeah, yeah it's a full full euro usually with like a teach it at a convention or play test it's it's i'll use like a two-hour block to teach it and try to get through and take a little bit of feedback at the end i'll fit a two-hour block generally Sometimes on TTS, it's a little slower. Oh, I'm, I'm a master at TTS. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan, but it's a necessary evil for what we do. Is it, uh, is it on TTS right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you want to play with us, uh, you can definitely play test. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. So one that, um, as we talked about before we started, that um, just is fulfilling now, Endless Winter, which is a really neat looking one because, I mean, it's prehistoric based game which you don't see a whole lot of those out there i you know if you want to talk about that one a little bit because it seems a very interesting one i i just saw it pop up on a couple um uh facebook groups that you know talk about board games and people were just receiving them and they were like oh, i just got this game it looks really awesome and i saw it but i haven't really looked into it and then after i saw the on the post i was like oh let me check this out and i was like wow this looks really neat it's um so it was designed and developed uh, concurrently um, when Arnak and Dune Imperium were being made. It was one of, the, one of those weird things where worker placement and deck builder uh, hybrids had like basically three things all kind of came out at once. The thing was is two of those came out in retail right then and one of them went to Kickstarter right then. That was us. So we're, we're kind of like late to the party by a little bit and then by a lot because of shipping and stuff, making it, making it much longer um, process in the pipeline. So it's, it's finally coming out uh, um, and it does hybridize those things in a different way than both those games do. But there is a little bit of overlap, which was, which was interesting because it was already you know, done by the time I play Arnak or um, Dune Imperium. And just, I really wanted to play those two games just to see what did they do? You know, Paul Denon's a great designer. What, what did he do as far as um, this goes and being like, oh, cool. Like there's, there's some little similarities in certain parts of it. There's some big differences. Um, and this one is kind of the, the thing that's probably most different about it is, is in this one, you're placing a worker and depending on the different location that you place the worker, 
you can play cards to kind of power that worker to do things. And so if you have cards that you put into your deck that specialize in the place that you put it there, it'll do them much more efficiently. So if you send somebody out to the hunting grounds to go find mammoths or whatever, and you put, have a bunch, bunch of hunting cards in your deck, you can then lay those out and do these big old powerful combos and hunt a whole bunch of stuff. Or if you're going to go on that kind of what looks like a Catan map, like a big um, area majorities building area, uh, you'd use these migrate actions. So you might have a ton of movement points um, built up in your, in your deck. You go, okay, this hand is great for movement points. I'm going to put my guy there and then spam that really hard and move, move all my units out. Um, so that's kind of the, the main gist. And then the next little step is that cards that you uh, don't play in the round at the end of the rounds because they you know, place workers, place workers, and then eventually they'll come back. Um, before that happens, you can take any cards that you want from your hand and you place them into a face down pile. And this becomes basically a bid for turn order. So uh, when you reveal those, you look at the rank of your hand and go like, okay, I've got say, let's say five influence. That's gonna put me in first in player order. And then the player is, oh, you got three, that's next best. And that changes the player order for the worker placement in the next round. And then the lower half of the cards all fire off at that point of those cards that you put in there. Where normally if you played those um, by some other means that lower half is ignored. So that's where there's that little thing of like Dune Imperium. I think you're left over with a couple of cards in your hand and then you get those little perks off the bottom this kind of turns into this big tableau that you can make with multiple cards and then you can fire off this big old chain combo in any uh, order that you choose right before you score the board in play in the new player order so it can be this kind of dramatic uh, unfolding of how you play to that round like you play to the end game where you're placing workers and, and throwing your cards as fast as you can to do stuff or do you sandbag a little bit put those in your thing slam player order really hard and then unveil this different um action tableau that'll fire off and um then basically each, there's a bunch of mini games kind of like um because yeah similar to like trajan or coloma or something like that where over here there's a big map and you're moving around getting area majorities that's gonna give you resources then your deck building that's one mini game then you got this little abstract stacking these components megaliths and that's unlocking your player board kind of like a entire mystica thing and then you got this track and that's unlocking abilities over here so there's a lot of these different little domains and then all the set collecting of animals and then tipping them over to unlock their abilities um each of those is kind of like say a path to victory or you could blend those in a whole bunch of different ways and um at best you could probably be good at like three of any of those five in any given game and you're just going to have to let some of them kind of be your dump stat and try different focuses and um kind of squeeze in where other players might be ignoring something like oh people aren't hunting that much therefore there's more animals for me and you might leverage that information a little bit really sounds like, like something oh this sounds like something we would have to try because we're very big into dune imperium i mean almost all of us put it in our top 10 oh yeah. nice okay almost yeah, all yeah. of us except for one that almost. got kicked off the show that's down below there <laughs> I, I was like my 15 or 16 Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Until the expansion, then it's up in the top 10. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I will say the dry erase boards on that uh, cave painting expansion, those look really, really cool. The boards themselves. And it looks yeah, like, that is that like an like action selection thing. for that? So, uh, so what that does is, so there's four main worker placement uh, spots in the main game, and then, then becomes this fifth one, which is your cave painting sport. And so it's kind of like what you'd expect from like a roll and write or flip and write, except for there isn't a rolling or flipping mechanism involved in it. And so you get this little easel. I'll show kind of the outline of an animal of sorts on the back. It has different animals for different asymmetries. And then the front just shows a big mammoth. And as you go out and put your worker out there and you take painting actions, it's going to allow you to uh, fill in different um, colored dots with different resources and abilities. And then you have the means to um, connect the dots by filling in lines. And as you encircle different things that will fire off uh, immediate benefits or um, kind of ongoing benefits. And then if you can kind of draw the outline around the whole thing, you score your longest connected path. And so the neat thing about that is, as Ken mentioned before, like the, the, more, the four main areas are pretty specific as to what they do. Like this is where you go if you want to get new tribes members into your deck. This is where you go if you want to build up technologies. This is where you go if you want to hunt. And this is where you go if you want to migrate and move on the board. They're pretty like linear as far as what you do at each of those spots. Um, there can be some weird blending with chaining effects and all that, but typically 
if you really want to like move around the board, the best way to do it is go and do the migrate action. With this K painting thing, you might set something up where you're blocking off certain areas and then you draw just the right little lines and it might fire off a weird hybrid of this stuff. Where it's like, I get to do a little technology and move on the track and all this stuff. So it lets you kind of backdoor in weird varieties into the systems in a um, much more nonlinear sort of way. And that's, that's kind of the gist mechanically what it's doing. And then in the end you get a really cool looking like, um, you know, actual cape painting. You can draw googly eyes on the, uh, you know, saber tooth tiger if you want or whatever. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the fact that I, I really love the mechanic of, you know, the cards you don't use being impo very important, which you talked about in the base game. And that's a mechanic I think it's underutilized. Dune Imperium did use it to some degrees, but not that many other games actually do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably underutilized. I mean, I've seen some like really old games where it's like, uh, Reiner Knizia or something, it's like, oh, you play these cards to like move up these tracks, but it's only the cards that you didn't play that score the points for said tracks or something like that. So they kind of played with like some family games where there's kind of that inversion of the, you know, positive negative space of played or non-played cards. But um, overall, it's probably a pretty underutilized area. Um, and that's, you know, it's one of those fun things with multi-purpose cards is to be like, you know, do, do you do for this effect? You discard for this other effect? Is it trash ability? And then you go, is there like a withholding ability or something like that um, to be worked with? So yeah, it's, it's definitely cool. And um, when I first came on the project, it was kind of like you had to go to a worker placement spot and send a worker there and then compile the cards into that spot. And if you didn't go to that worker spot, you couldn't do partake in that phase. And it turned out most of the time, because it's worker placement, though only one or two players would even do that. And so they'd always take majority and then they'd unveil their cards and do their thing at the end of the round. And it was so much fun that um, I was like, this needs to happen. like for free like all the time at the end of every round everybody should put their leftover cards into this pile and just let it fire off and um we tried it that way and we're like okay this is fun and uh we had to fluff the economy just a little bit because we found that the card economy was so tight that some people would have no cards or one card left by the end of the round and like we want them to have enough stuff that they don't feel bad about depositing these extra cards into this spot and so we fluffed it up just a little bit um like took away um i think there's a hand size limit at some point we're like ah, oh, let's just let them you know try to acquire as many cards as they can to buy actions and stuff like that so they can really you know spam this if they want to yeah i like that a lot i like multi-purpose cards and i like that idea a lot so definitely got to try that out in my game it'd be you know heaven there you go. Yeah, I hope people like it. I'm, I'm, you know, I think we've we have a little bit of confidence because a lot of people played on TTS over like you know the pandemic era and all that. That we're just so excited. And we have a pretty decent scripted mod for it on um, Steam Workshop. So a lot of the early ratings and stuff weren't just hype ratings of somebody who wants to like the game, hopes to like the game. It was people who went on there and actually you know fought with TTS and learned the thing and had a good time and came back and reported that. It, Yes, it's fun on TTS, and I can't wait to get it on real life because it's going to be great and deluxe and easy to use. So. Well, TTS was amazing during COVID. I'm done with it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I just use it for remote testing. You know, but working with the Europeans, like you know, these guys are in Greece and Cyprus that I work with mostly, so we have to get together and test that way. But if, if possible, I'd, I'd prefer to build physical prototypes still and just wrangle warm bodies. Yeah, and there's, there's always something about the tactile feel of the game and stuff and being able to... I mean, it's, I, I find it a lot easier to play a game physically, and I'm, it's more intuitive for me when it's physical than it is on TTS. Mm -hmm. I always have a hard time. Yeah, it is. I was playing something last night, and it's like, you know, just remember, like, weird shorthands. Okay, if this is a bag with infinite coins in it, you hold on one button and you right-click the other, and then it'll aggregate your coins and you drag them over and it's like it's so much easier in real life to just you know take some iron clays or some resources and just pick them up in one fell swoop and um or getting that silly thing in tts where you're like click drag click drag i need five doubloons and you're just doing this over and over again it's like you don't do that in real life you know you have two hands you can use them pretty well and you're grabbing this while you're putting that there um some odd anomalous things like uh endless winter if you have this kind of trifecta of these little tents you can upgrade that into a village and 
uh, on TTS, it's really tempting to grab the tents and put them back in your supply. And then you got to go put your village and you're like, oh crap, where does this go again? Because I removed the tents. And in real life, it becomes one of those like Indiana Jones things. You've already got the village in this hand and you're gone. And you do this swap right there. And it's so intuitive. Everybody does it. And it's almost like, why would you have to think that people would forget where they're where they are presently like you're here in the moment but on tts it became you know problematic thing we'd actually have to tell people put the village down first and then remove the camps i know that's counterintuitive and athematic but um just do it that way because otherwise you're going to lose your spot and uh just strange things like that happen on tts and if you you know adjust to making it easier on tts then it might be hurting the game in real life and vice versa and ultimately um uh, you know i make analog games so it's to me it's all in service of the table space and hands and eyeballs and people so if you want to see a disaster of a tts play watch james play that <laughs> yeah i am literally the worst tts player i try to learn all the things and it just doesn't I'm, I'm pretty bad at it too. I, I see some people, you know, with all these like cameras that are like swerving around and zooming and popping out all this stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? You get, are you like an octopus? How do you have so many <laughs> keyboard shortcuts and hands to manage all this stuff? It blows my mind. To me, it's like playing board games underwater with chopsticks. It's like, yeah, it's not fun. So, yeah, I'm the same exact way with that. I feel like I should be offended though, because if it wasn't for TTS, James would only get to play with me like once a year. That's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely a good company helps. So, that's, that's good. Right. so uh, basically, uh, definitely want to thank you, Johnny, for showing up here. It was great talking to you. I'm super excited about your new games coming out. And I love, love Merchant Cove. Awesome game. So do you want to tell people where they can uh, find you at? Uh, yeah, so I've got johnnypack.com, J-O-N-N-Y, no H, P-A-C.com. That's where I've got some of my designs and things. I'm um, also on uh, Facebook and Twitter. I don't have an Instagram yet, but I might get one eventually because I'm kind of pivoting away from Twitter. It's not my favorite, most positive environment, but um, I think Instagram might be where I'm going to go next with that. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty easy to look up. Uh, you could email me at johnnypack at gmail.com if you had further inquiries, whatever else. And I always reply and BGG. Johnny packs my username and always reply to geek mail on there too. Yep. And we'll put those uh, links down in the uh, description of this video. So it'll make it even okay. easier. And uh, again, I just want to thank you for uh, coming here and spending time with us and tell us about your games and your designing career. I really appreciate that. And it was really awesome talking to you. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for everyone listening. <laughs>